Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome back uh, to Global Neurosciences Institute, uh, Grand Rounds. Um, uh, we definitely have an exciting talk today. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jill Farmer. Dr. Farmer is an assistant professor of neurology at Drexel and the director of Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Program at Global Neurosciences Institute. Um, she has worked with a GNI team for close to 10 years and has built a comprehensive patient center program offering the latest medical and surgical management for Parkinson's disease, as well as patterning with a re rehab specialist in the community to offer PD specific therapies. Um, her clinical and research interests include non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease and functional movement disorders. She developed the Delaware Valley Regional Movement Disorder Meeting, uh, which is a quarterly educational event for movement disorder specialists and their teams. She currently serves on the editorial boards of Practical Neurology and Neurology Live Movement Disorder section. Um, she's a graduate of the Pelotucci uh, Advocacy Leaders Forum and has participated in numerous uh, efforts throughout the American Academy of Neurology. She serves multiple advisory boards and committees, including CIRI, which is Cannabis Education and Research Institute. Dr. Farmer is one of the lead administrators for the Women in Neurology Group, which she has helped grow to over uh, 3,500 international members. Uh, she is the former president of the Philadelphia Neurological Society, the oldest neurological society in the country, and was one of a handful of women presidents for the PNS in its 100 plus year history. Um, Dr. Farmer will be speaking today about medical marijuana use in Parkinson's disease. Dr. Farmer, it is definitely our pleasure to have you here. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today on this topic. I know we have people from all over the region and uh, a wide range of ages in our attendees, but I don't think anybody is old enough to remember this as it came out in 1936 in its um, uh, initial inception, but you probably know it because it's kitschy and culturally relevant. And there was um, a, a, a dramatization of the potential impacts of marijuana, and there was a propaganda campaign called Reefer Madness to uh, tell parents to tell their children, you know, to stay away from the dangers of this absolutely horrible drug that can cause them to be, uh, you know, vagrant, zombie-like um, uh, uh, individuals. So. There is definitely a skepticism when it comes to marijuana. Um, and then, you know, there's the stigma that's attached to it as it's progressed through through the ages. So today we're going to try and destigmatize some of the medical marijuana um, perceptions, particularly as it relates to Parkinson's disease. So this was a fact as stated by one of the directors of the National Parkinson's Foundation about two to three years ago. Um, there is no evidence to support medical marijuana is effective for treating Parkinson's disease. And I was part of the um, uh, participants of this advisory panel. And I kind of gritted my teeth and, and shrugged my shoulders a little bit because I, re I respectfully disagreed. Um, I think that there is a statement to be made that there are no large double-blinded placebo control studies, which we all know are the gold standard in support of medical marijuana for treating the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, because that is what the traditional pharmacologic approach to Parkinson's management has been. Everything has focused on dopamine, which really has focused on mitigating the motor symptoms, the tremor, the stiffness, the rigidity, um, slowness, uh, things like that. And there is a reason why there's no large blinded uh, placebo controlled studies. And that has a lot to do, as everybody knows, with how medical marijuana or marijuana in general is scheduled. Um, we're just not allowed to do the type of research that we would like. And the strains that are available to do research on really are no way equitable to what is available to patients already. So I say, let's stop the madness and start the sanity because I think that there is evidence. There is evidence that you have to go out and seek, but it's there. There are preclinical studies, there are multiple surveys, there is much anecdotal evidence. Um, and this might be not the gold standard, but it's still a base of information to start from. And it supports that medical marijuana may be helpful in treating both the motor and even more so the non-motor and hyperkinetic movements of Parkinsonism. And the non-motor symptoms for anybody that treats Parkinson's on a regular basis 
can be more debilitating for patients than the motor symptoms. Again, we have really good medications to treat the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but when it comes to things like pain, when it comes to things like sleep, when it comes to things like anxiety, we're borrowing from other spaces to use them in our patients. We already know their brain chemistry is altered in some way, and the treatments are not as effective as we would like them to be. So getting back to the basics, when you think about medical marijuana, it's a plant species with over 100 pharmacologically active compounds, and it's been used for quite some time as a potential treatment for certain conditions. In the 1880s, Dr. Gowers described it in his Manual of Diseases of the Nervous System, and he talks about various treatments for tremor. And he says that using different types of uh, cannabinoids, in particular Indian hemp, are quite can quiet a tremor for some time. And he gives a description of a potential long-term benefit in a patient. And he describes the case where um, after an accident, a tremor immediately commenced um, in a, uh, the right arm and leg of a, of a patient. And it extended for about three months into the left arm. And then after about two years, there was a constant lateral movement of the wrist and joints, but no tremor in the fingers. And a great improvement occurred with the use of hemp for about a year after they have been using it um, where the tremor became much more minimal. Now, I wouldn't argue that this was Parkinson's because the description, looking at it with you know um, hindsight and what we know now, post-traumatic, starts immediately, switches sides. It may very well be more on the functional or the conversion psychogenic spectrum. It could have been an injury or a bleed or something like that given the accident as well. But typically, again, they don't switch sides when they occur or do they occur that quickly. Um, but the point is that it showed improvement. And I think this leads again more into the idea of the non-motor symptoms, the things that are driving motor components um, because of things like stress, anxiety, stuff like that. So while not exactly Parkinson's, I do think it shows that there has been a thought process behind the use of this um, for some time, and it's not a new phenomenon. So sativa and indica are the most commonly used species. Um, sativa has more THC, which is a psychoactive compound. Indica has more CBD, and which is typically used in the medical marijuana compounds because it's more therapeutic. They can be either synthetic, man-made, phytocannabinoid coming from a plant, or endogenous, made in our own body. And they work on receptors of the endocannabinoid system. And we already know that there are medications in use that work on this system, um, medications for nausea, uh, medications to help with stimulate, uh, stimulating appetite. And the most, the newest, I should say, um, pharmacologic medication is Epidiolex for intractable seizures um, in patients, which came out of the use of medical marijuana um, or recreational marijuana that had been um, seen to have an improvement on patients with uh, intractable seizures. So when I Googled the interaction between dopamine cognition um, uh, and the emotional system, this came up and I have no idea what this slide is or what it represents, but I do love it in the sense that it shows the complexity. So we're not dealing with anything in isolation. So there are so many pathways at play when it comes to the influence of the dopaminergic system in the body. And we know that there are regulators, there are inhibitors, there, there are stimulants, there are things that fluctuate within the body on a minute by minute basis that can impact motor, non-motor symptoms that we see in our patients with Parkinson's disease. So this is really just to give you the idea that nothing happens in isolation. And if we focus simply on one thing, we're missing the boat on how it interplays with others. And so the context of why even consider medical marijuana in uh, Parkinson's disease is we know that it has been thought of as something that holds great potential. So in um, 2003, Department of uh, Health and Human Services was granted a patent to use to look at the use of cannabinoids in the sativa plant in neurodegenerative conditions, in particularly Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and HIV. Um, currently, we have about 10 to 12 drugs that are used to treat Parkinson's disease. Um, they focus primarily on dopamine, and they really are reworking the same pathways 
and working to see how we can get dopaminergic tone more steady in the system by either replacing it, mimicking it, or recycling it, preventing its breakdown. But we also know that there are more than there is more than just dopamine at play, and more than just dopamine affects the multiple systems of Parkinson's. And by 2030, about nine million people worldwide will have Parkinson's disease. So, 10 to 12 meds for treating 9 million people, there is clearly room for potential of utility of other compounds to help with the management and possibly the disease progression and modification of, of Parkinson's disease. So as we said, the system in which cannabinoids induce their effect is the endocannabinoid system and receptors for this system are found in the peripheral and central nervous system. I'll be talking about the central nervous system. And there's a high density of these receptors in the basal ganglia, which is my space. This is the world where I live. And we know that in this pathway, that while dopamine is important, it is not the only medicine, it is not the only um, chemical that has an interaction on how Parkinson's disease presents. Serotonin is involved, histamine, acetylcholine, glutamate, adenosine, GABA, norepinephrine. And we have seen in uh, preclinical studies that there may be an interplay between the um, interaction of cannabinoids and particularly adenosine. And this is, I don't wanna say coincidentally, but maybe topically important because the newest medicine that we have for Parkinson's also appreciates the role of adenosine in the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. This is a medication called Norantz. It's an A2A receptor antagonist. And they have found that in patients that um, have Parkinson's and it progresses through different PET studies, there is an upregulation of adenosine receptors while there's a downregulation of dopaminergic receptors. So while we're so focused on giving medications that modulate dopamine in some way, there's less and less real estate to use those medications effectively as the disease progresses because of loss of the dopaminergic neurons, downregulation of receptors and whatnot. The, thing that becomes more prevalent is the adenosine receptor and modulating what is actually present in the brain may have a better potential impact on patients with Parkinson's symptoms. And the indirect pathway is the pathway that inhibits movement, II. So if you inhibit the inhibitor, then you have the potential to promote movement. Um, and primarily it is meant to be used in patients with increasing off times and um, increasing bradykinesia and stiffness. So if we know that there's an interplay between cannabinoid receptors and adenosine, then again, that gives the potential that there is a part to play for modulating cannabinoids um, in managing Parkinson's disease. And that's really what I'm hoping that you guys glean from this talk. It's not to show that this is the be all and end all. It's not to say that this is something that every single patient needs to use and that we're you know, doing a disservice by not um, having this on board as part of a treatment plan or profile. It's really just to get you comfortable with the idea that there is logic behind its use, that um, you don't have to think that it, talking about medical marijuana is on par of you know, alternative treatments that are pie in the sky and don't have evidence behind it. There are chemical and um, uh, uh, pharmacologic and uh, different pathophysiologic reasons why cannabinoids can play a role in the management of Parkinson's disease. So the primary receptors um, in the basal ganglia are CB1 receptors. Um, the binding of these receptors, they've shown, has an impact on dopamine, glutamate, and GABA. And they have really similar structures so that there can potentially be a direct effect on them. This is where it comes into play a little bit because the direct effect on dopamine may actually be inhibitory. So again, if we're just focusing on the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, it's okay that it gives pause because why are we gonna to wanna to inhibit dopamine? Um, but it's not just the dopaminergic uh, pathways that it plays a role on. It can also be implicated in the serotonergic and limbic systems, which we also know uh, can have either an indirect effect on the motor symptoms, but definitely a direct effect on the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So now you get to the idea of what do you think of someone who smokes marijuana? And you know that this is the thought that pops into your head, even if you are trying to be good and have it not be. Um, it is a, you think of a stoner, you think of somebody who is slow, you think of somebody who is way relaxed. And there is a reason for that because the main impact of cannabinoids is 
a hypokinesia. It is meant to sort of downregulate, um, particularly and slow things down, which is why, as I said in the beginning, looking at this for the hyperkinetic movement disorders, the dyskinesias, um, the dystonias, things like that that occur in Parkinson's disease may play more of a practical role than looking at it to a uh, quiet tremor. Tremor is not technically a hyperkinetic um, movement disorder in that way. The, the pathway of tremor is far more complex than that. Um, but the other idea is this idea of neuroprotection. Um, when we have the, what, what we're looking for and what we're going for moving forward is that are there entities that we can use that potentially modify the disease in some way? And we have no neuroprotective medication um, that has that indication as of yet. Could the um, research into cannabinoids lead down that pathway? Possibly. And it's just as valid a possibility as all of the other mechanisms that they're looking at for neuroprotection. They're looking into borrowing things from the cancer world. They're looking into borrowing things from um, uh, autoimmune modulation. So it is, it, I think it holds just as much potential as an area of discovery because we know that there are um, the potential for reducing oxidative stress and enhancing antioxidant defenses. And there is a wealth of information to say that those stressors are what lead to the dopaminergic um, uh, degeneration in uh, the dopaminergic neurons in Parkinson's disease. And it might have an impact on neuroinflammation. There were studies that looked at anti-inflammatories and things like that. And while none of these hit their endpoints to say that it showed a definite neuroprotective benefit, again, there is enough of a healthy curiosity with enough of trending preclinical studies to say that this is still an active area of research and deserves to be investigated further. The other thing is your brain chemistry changes at different stages of the disease. And this is one of the things I tell my patients all the time. Again, remember, we have 10 to 12 medicines to use for Parkinson's disease. And Classically, if it's idiopathic Parkinson's, we're gonna be dealing with this for decades. So there is definitely going to be revisiting medications that may have been tried and failed early on in the course of the disease, but may work better later in the course of the disease. And that's because the chemistry of the brain changes. Um, Pre-symptomatic uh, Parkinson, Parkinson's disease, the malfunction and desensitization and downregulation of CB receptors might be uh, present that they've seen in animal studies and preclinical models. More moderate advanced stages due to neuronal death, there might be an upregulation of CB receptors. And again, if you're thinking about from a motor standpoint, hypokinetic movements and hypokinesia and slowing things down, that goes along with what we see clinically in patients with Parkinson's, that there is a slowing down and a bradykinesia and things like that. Um, there's, an up, there's an increase in anxiety. There's an increase in sleep disturbances. There's an increase in, in pain. So how these, this upregulation of the CB receptors may be implicated in being regulated through different interventions, whether it's pharmacologic, medical marijuana, again, there is the potential for some sort of clinical benefit to be elicited. And I mentioned this already, why are we not talking about motors, uh, particularly the tremor system specifically? Again, it's really complex and it's not modulated by, by dopamine alone. Um, so it's not something where I would say out of all of the symptoms that medical marijuana can potentially help with with Parkinson's, this is probably fourth or fifth on my list when I'm having the conversation with patients. Um, they, everybody will come in and say that they've seen the video on YouTube where somebody takes a bite of, I don't know if it's a brownie or a cookie or whatever it might've been. And all of a sudden their tremor stops. And I say, we have to take that one because it's on YouTube with a grain of salt. And two, we know that from what we can glean from studies outside of the Parkinson's space, that that might not be the most consistent benefit that we see. Um, but again, borrowing with studies from outside the Parkinson space, we do know that there is data about the non-motor symptoms, the pain, the sleep, the anxiety, things like that. So looking at it more specifically in Parkinson's disease, what we saw in a study from uh, the movement disorders, 
uh, journal is that they surveyed 339 patients, 46% found a significant overall improvement in general PD symptoms, um, 31 in resting tremor, 38 in rigidity, 45 in bradykinesia, and 14 in dyskinesias. And again, the bradykinesia one always kind of gives people pause. Well, how can they see an improvement in slowness when we know that cannabinoids are going to potentially make people feel more slow? And I think what this boils down to is a combination between rigidity and bradykinesia because semantics is, is important. And lots of time, the slowness comes from the increased tone. So I think that there is a, a combination of maybe more of an improvement in the rigidity than people anticipated. And they translated that into um, uh, an improvement in the bradykinesia. Um, a more recent study in Parkinson's disease patients in Colorado, 5% of patients use medical marijuana and found most improvement in non-motor symptoms. Again, so this is a um, uh, in support of the idea that the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's are, are something that may be impacted by the use of medical marijuana. And when we talk about non-motor symptoms and Parkinson's disease, just think about what we're using to treat those symptoms now. For patients with sleep disturbances, my patient population, you know, is, is a geriatric patient population. I wouldn't even say that it's on, you know, 65 and above. I would say more, more so it's 75, 80 and above. Um, and they have sleep fragmentation and rest, REM behavioral sleep disorder and things like that. And what am I giving them? I'm giving them clonopin. I'm giving them a benzodiazepine. Um, I probably prescribe benzos fairly frequently compared to anybody else that treats a geriatric patient population because they're a good drug for sleep. They're a good drug for anxiety. They're a good drug for tremor and they work well in Parkinson's patients. And for the most part, they're tolerated, but we know that's not the case for everybody. So when we're worried about patients that have extreme balance problems or some cognitive effect or concerns, and the use of a benzo may precipitate and propagate some of those issues, it's nice to know that there is the potential for another option that can have less of those um, cognitive effects, less of those psychotropic effects and things like that. Um, when we're talking about pain and we're talking about restless leg, or refractory restless leg. We're looking at medications like tramadol and sometimes even opioids. And we all know that these medications come with their own host of issues and side effects. So again, when you're looking at a uh, risk to benefit ratio, we're already using medicines that are pretty risky. So if there are other options that may potentially be less risky and have the option to have a good clinical benefit, then I think it's worth an investigation to, uh, of consideration for those. Um, for other studies in PD, they looked at how the medical marijuana was ingested and if it mattered. Um, obviously, smoking would be the most robust because that gets into the system most quickly, but that's probably the least common way that medical marijuana is used. Um, it's uh, usually tinctures, oils, extracts, edibles, things like that. The duration of benefit appears to be about three hours with some concern for rebound motor symptom after wearing off. That's not to be, that's not unexpected, um, especially if you think about tremor control and stuff like that with other ingestible things, perhaps alcohol. We know that there is an improvement that can be seen. Same thing with benzos, there's an improvement that could be seen, but as it wears off, there may be a slight increase in symptoms until it self-regulates again. Um, the psychosis is 50-50. Um, and again, this would never be something that I would recommend for somebody that had profound psychosis. Um, and because it definitely has the potential for worsening that, even if you're using a higher CBD ratio to THC ratio. Um, and then they were looking at synthetic cannabinoids, nebulone um, for reducing dyskinesias. Some formulations uh, uh, showed positivity, some formulations showed negativity. And I think that is consistent again with other ingestibles that we've seen. They've looked for um, uh, medications that are essentially a pill form of, of alcohol for the treatment of essential tremor. And for whatever reason, um, drinking a regular beer or having a regular cocktail, having a glass of wine improves essential tremor still better than having the synthetic um, uh, uh, alcohol uh, via pill. Um, and we don't know why it's not replicate, replicable in that way. 
We also know that pain is really common in patients with Parkinson's disease. And we know pain in the Parkinson's space and pain outside the Parkinson's space is really difficult to manage. Um, this is again, because pain is complex. There was a recent study that just came out in JAMA, I think over the past few days, that showed how when behavioral therapy is used in combination with medications or even in alone without the use of, of medications early on in um, the diagnosis of chronic pain, that patients have a persistent and prolonged uh, improvement of, of symptoms over just medication management alone. Um, so again, those treatment strategies are telling of the complexities of what is happening under the pathology of chronic pain syndromes. And it's no different in Parkinson's disease because again, we know that there is an interplay between mood and motor symptoms. Um, and unfortunately for pain management, specifically pain management in Parkinson's and just in general mood symptoms what, oh, as they need to be addressed, that's a rate limiting step for everybody because access to those services is, is just so difficult. Um, so if we have medications that might also be beneficial without some of the addictive side effects or the cognitive side effects that come with chronic pain management, again, it's something that's worthy to look into as, as a potential treatment strategy. Depression and anxiety, again, we know that this is common in Parkinson's disease. We know that it increases as the disease progresses. And how are we managing it? We're managing it with you know, SSRIs. We're managing it with benzodiazepines. Unfortunately, the behavioral strategies are lacking because of the access issues, which we just mentioned. And it is something that can, in a roundabout way, impact the stability of the motor symptoms of the patients that we're seeing. So. When we're talking to patients about how well medical marijuana may impact tremor, it's really important to tease out when they're getting their tremor. So if it's somebody with a you know, constant rest tremor that's going no matter what, chances are medical marijuana isn't gonna be the kind of intervention that's going to add any benefit to those patients' um, clinical improvement. If you get the story though, that for the most part, their tremor is well controlled, but if they go into a social situation, their tremor really starts to pick up on them. If they are, you know, under stress because of anything, could be good stress, could be bad stress, but they can tell that when these, you know, the homeostasis of whatever it is that they usually do on a daily basis is interrupted in some way, that tremor breaks through. So that's a tremor that's driven by anxiety. Could that tremor then be improved with the use of medical marijuana? It possibly could, because for that patient, I might've said, well, maybe a little Xanax every now and then might help. Again, the same strategy and the same rationale can be applied um, with just a different, a different substance. So between 50 and 90 patients, 90% 90 of patients in Parkinson's disease have sleep disturbances, including fragmentation, insomnia, and REM behavioral sleep disorder. And I would say this along with constipation, which I honestly don't know how medical marijuana would impact constipation, but those two things are things I remember to ask about at every single visit because they play such a huge role in quality of life, not just for the patient, but for the care partner, um, especially the sleeping. I can't get my loved one to sleep. They are up all hours of the night and they're not just up, but they're screaming and they're disruptive and I can't redirect them and I can't get them back. And if it stays like this, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to maybe either get somebody to come and live in, which I don't really want, or I might even have to transition them over to a facility, which would kill me if I had to do it. So these are the, the conversations that we have. And the goal is to always try to you know manage symptoms as best we can at home while keeping the patients as safe as possible possible. I would prescribe clonopin and I would say, okay, keep an eye on it and monitor for falls. If they do get up, make sure that they're not overly confused in the middle of the night and see how they do. And clonopin still works and I use it quite, quite routinely. Um, but for some people it doesn't, or they have side effects to it and they can't tolerate it. Now, another option for them to consider is medical marijuana. Um, again, a little bit before bedtime, it might be something that is beneficial for them that they tolerate better and can help 
not get them to sleep through the full night. I tell all my patients that that is a, um, an unrealistic expectation, no matter what intervention we're going to use. But our goal is to try to get the sleep fragmentations to be less frequent and to, when you do wake up or there is an issue that you're able to fall back asleep more easily so it's less disruptive. And cannabinoids have been shown to help with all of these um, uh, sleep disturbances that we've seen both in Parkinson's and in just regular sleep literature. Um, it's studied in over 2,000 patients, and it was shown to be an, a, an improvement in both pain and sleep disturbance. So it's something that, again, just planting the seed that if you are using a combination of medications and it's not working quite effect as effectively as you want, this may be another option to try um, and consider. This is one of the big hurdles as to why. What about adverse effects in addiction? Addiction risk is extremely low for marijuana. Um, that's been proven time and time again, and that's definitely something that you can say with confidence to your patients, especially in the medical marijuana formulations where the psychotropic effect is, is mitigated. Um, anything that acts centrally has similar side effect profile. It can cause balance issues, memory issues, hallucinations, delusions, and dizziness. Um, but again, these are not different from the side effect profiles of the other medications that we might be using that are pharmacologically available. So let's get to the practical part of prescribing. I have prescribing in quotes because we can't. I mean, that's what we call it because for lack of a better term and everybody understands what that means, but really what we do is recommend or provide a clearance. Um, I'm licensed to prescribe in both New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So in order to do that, you have to sit through a course. It's not very long, um, uh, you know, take a test, get certified. There is a cost associated with it. And then once you have been cleared to be able to um, uh, recommend medical marijuana to your patients, it really becomes a conversation of, I think this is something that might be helpful for you. Um, so I can give you a clearance to go and take to a dispensary and you'll have a conversation at the dispensary about the different strains, the different types, um, the different ratios of CBD and THC. So there is a lot of heavy lifting on the patient's part if this is something that they want to do, which is good and bad. It allows for investment and, um, you know, ownership by the patient that this is something that they want to do and try. So they have to do a little bit of their research, but it's a hurdle. It's a clear hurdle. And especially in my patient population that tends to be a little bit older, it can be the rate limiting step of whether or not this is something that they continue with doing because they can't, they don't like the idea of it being so much on them. They don't like the idea that there isn't something more regulated about it. Um, but what I try to explain to them is I'm here to help if they have questions about it. And it's no different if they put it in context of the other medications we try. We Trial and error in Parkinson's is pretty much the norm when it comes to symptomatic management. Okay, we'll start with a little bit of dopamine. We don't know how you're gonna respond to it. Let's cut the pills in half to make sure that you uh, don't get as much nausea, that you don't feel as nauseous, that you don't feel as sleepy or tired. And then we'll slowly bring that up over time. And how you feel as we slowly bring that up will determine our dose. If it doesn't work for you, we'll try something else. Same idea with medical marijuana. You have to try one strain, see how it works for you. If it doesn't work, we come off of that and then you try something else. The difference is the cost. This is an entirely out-of-pocket expense for the patient. They have to pay for a license. They have to pay for the medical marijuana. It is not something that is covered by insurance yet. That's something that is absolutely being looked into um, in order to help stratify the cost process so that that doesn't become as much of a rate limiting step for patients. So in the state of New Jersey, if you have a patient that is curious about trying medical marijuana, this is a wonderful website. And if you Google New Jersey medical marijuana program, this will pop up and it really gives them a, a, a hub of where they can find all of the uh, information that they need about how to 
how to register themselves, what the cost might be, um, and where the dispensaries are. And it's important to get the lingo correct because they're called alternative treatment centers, um, not necessarily dispensaries. So that is again something that uh, when you're having a conversation with patients, you need to let them know. And this is the forward facing pa uh, uh, patient page. The other page is for the medical provider. So here is where I do my most of my interaction with the medical marijuana program in the state of New Jersey. Here's where I register patients. Here's where I um, uh, got my uh, license to prescribe. And this is a wonderful resource because in the state of New Jersey, they have a database of your patients that you've prescribed for, and it can tell you who's active, it can tell you who has not re has not filled, it can tell you um, who is in the process of renewal, and by doing so, it allows you to form a cohort. And this is important, again, as we look to build evidence for being able to justify the use of medical marijuana in certain conditions. Now, um, in the state of Pennsylvania, I'm mean, sorry, in the state of New Jersey, I register the patient. I will will have this conversation in the clinic. I'll go into this database. I will enroll them, and then they take that information and complete the enrollment process on their end. In Pennsylvania, it's a little bit different. These are the intern. Oh, this is the alternative treatment centers in New Jersey. And I will tell you when I when I was first. Um, uh, enrolled in the program when I first got my, my clearance, there were six um, treatment centers in the entire state, none of them in my area. Patients had to drive an hour and a half or longer if they needed something. Now we're at 24 um, and they're looking to increase this availability even more. So um, it's something that is only going to increase in its availability and only going to increase in its curiosity for the patients that are interested in trying it. In the state of Pennsylvania, this is the website. So if you just Google Pennsylvania Medical Marijuana Program, this is the uh, patient facing website that will pop up. Again, has all the information that they need about how to get registered, information about um, the medical marijuana program. In the state of Pennsylvania, it's a little bit different. Patients initiate the registration process. So they will go in, they'll fill out all of their information, and then they'll let me know when that's completed. And then I go in and certify their registration. Um, still all the same information, just a reversal of, of the steps of how to do it. Um, I, it's a little bit easier in New Jersey because I get, I, they leave the visit and I know that they are, um, uh, that my part of the process is done. I don't have to wait for them to, to come back to me with that information, but it's the same idea. Uh, again, they can find their dispensaries or alternative treatment centers through this website. They can um, uh, figure out and enroll there. Um, for their license. This is the provider hub. So this is what I use to interact with the Pennsylvania Medical Marijuana Program and how I certify patients' registrations and information. So here are some of our takeaway tokens, um, if you will. I hope that through our discussion, you saw that particularly in Parkinson's disease, because cannabinoids play a role in the basal ganglia system and the neurotransmitter pathways that are impactful in Parkinson's, there is a role for investigating their use as um, a, a symptomatic management for some of these symptoms. We know through Parkinson's um, research, as well as through research in a larger space that pain, sleep, and anxiety can be most consistently improved um, with cannabinoid use. Um, given the ratio of high CBD in medical marijuana as opposed to THC, the side effect profile tends to be relatively safe and comparable to the other medications that we're using. And most importantly, patients are going to continue to ask. I got involved in this because patients kept asking me. And initially I would say, oh, I don't know much. I, I, I don't know about that just yet. And then again, when you get hit over the head enough times with the same questions, you're like, oh, well, I better figure this out. So I researched and figured out how to get licensed and how to get approved in order to do this, mostly because I didn't, my, my patients seeking this elsewhere. Parkinson's is complex. We know that from that diagram in the beginning, but we just know it clinically as well, that 
there are many symptoms that occur under the umbrella of Parkinson's disease. And when I'm managing patients, sometimes I'm wearing the hat of a psychiatrist, sometimes I'm wearing the hat of a GI specialist, sometimes I'm wearing the hat of an autonomic specialist, sometimes I'm wearing the hat of a sleep doc. So I know that whenever we introduce something to manage these symptoms, it's going to have a role or an impact on the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And I want to be able to have an educated conversation with a patient to let them know that, okay, this is something that we could try. I think it makes sense or no, absolutely not. What you're using this for could wreak havoc on X, Y, and Z. And I really don't think that it's something that we should consider. Whereas somebody who's not familiar with Parkinson's, they just hung up a shingle and is giving medical marijuana clearances um, for cash. They're not going to know, and they could have a negative impact on my patient's overall quality of life. So what I wanted to do was be able to be well educated and versed in how this can be used in combination with the more standards of care um, for Parkinson's disease, because patients are going to do what they want to do. Um, and if you don't help them out, they're going to seek it elsewhere. And the other idea is I just Googled medical marijuana. I'm not Googled, but I put into pump bed medical marijuana. That's it, not classifying by disease type or anything like that. And you can just see this trend. You can see the trend from nothing all the way up to over thousands of articles um, in you know the late 2019s, 2020, um, uh, just out of interest, curiosity, and understanding that this is going to play a key role um, in uh, disease strategies going forward. So with that, I'll stop and I'll, I'm happy to take any questions. Dr. Farmer, thank you very much. It's a great talk. And I think it's a, also a great talk is to make people comfortable with it yeah. because it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, you're not comfortable until, until you're comfortable, until you mm -hmm. hear whether there is science. And, you know, it's, it's definitely very important talk because there are so many, I, I probably every second, third patient I see right now are on medical marijuana for one thing or another, right. you know, it's just, you, you question whether it's really, you know, right. so people, but you know, that's mm -hmm. for another time. So we have some questions here. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the medical, the problem medical community has, it's not necessarily the idea of medical marijuana, et cetera, but how it is being prescribed or handled. Sure. Mm -hmm. And because we do like, you know, to be in charge, you know, if I'm prescribing something, I know I'm, it's 10 milligrams, I know exactly, you know, what I'm giving, et cetera. Okay. Here, it seems a little bit still wild west here. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's true. And, 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 and uh, so, do you have any say you know how much control do we have you know when we when you you know you're saying prescribing but probably you know it, it would be the, the better word refer you know yeah. you just refer mm -hmm. them you know <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, no it yeah that 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 honestly is the most legitimate and the understandable reason why it gives people pause to do again putting it into perspective there are things that we prescribe now where if you are you know attending a talk it will say well the exact mechanism of this medication is not known. And I think that is true. We just have more familiarity with it because it's available at a local CVS. So somehow that makes it feel more um, uh, uh, consistent and and easier to and palatable to prescribe. When it there absolutely needs to be more data to suggest how these work for certain situations. It's just that the way that we're going to go about doing it is going to be almost like a reverse engineered way. We can't do the gold standards. It's just not possible to do the double blind clinical trials the way that we want to simply because of how it's scheduled. And that is going to be a fight that isn't going to have a resolution anytime soon. So because they already put the cart before the horse and approved medical marijuana for all of these conditions without knowing this information beforehand, um, we already know that patients are using it. So the way that we're going to get this information and data is by doing patient-directed research. So that's one of the things that Siri looks into um, as well as other uh, um, uh, platforms is going through searching which, which patients with different diagnoses are using which particular strains of medical marijuana and quantifying which symptoms they're being helped with and how so that when we do start recommending or prescribing going forward. It's not just a clearance to say, this is something that you have to discuss with the dispensary, find out the types of medical marijuana they have there and what they 
would recommend for your symptom X, Y, and Z. I can then say, well, I think that you should have this ratio of CBD to THC. I think you should look at this strain um, um, and have this discussion because we don't have that wealth of information yet, but that's the goal of what the research is going forward. Um, so it really very much is a partnership between patient data collection and docs conversing amongst themselves to see what they're using in their clinics and what they're seeing as having the best benefit for the patient. The thing that makes it a little less frightening for me, as I said, when doing this are, is that my alternative medicines for what I'm using the medical marijuana for have a pretty significant side effect profile already. So I think that it's a comparable um, uh, adjustment to, to try this as well. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, I'm, I'm probably medical marijuana is safer than clonazepam or something like yeah. that, you know, mm -hmm. when you look at it. But so it, it, you can recommend, but when you're recommending it, you're recommending it to the patient. Is that correct? It's so I'm, still, the decision will be at the dispensary. The decision will be at the dispensary, but I can put on my recommendation form that is there, it, there'll be a question. Is there anything the dispensary needs to know? And I can write on the form, this patient has cognitive issues. We want a high CBD ratio. We're tr looking primarily to address this for anxiety and sleep. So it directs them in some way so that it's not just a complete, like, I'm here for medical marijuana. What do you got? So, yeah. So that leads to the next question. Who are these people at the dispensaries? What is their <laughs> I mean, really, yeah. if you're referring to something, you have right. to trust them. You do. And that is also where it takes a little bit of legwork on the doc's part and a little bit of legwork on the patient's part. So they vary um, in who is available for information at different dispensaries. It is not a medical professional. Um, it is usually somebody that is well-versed in the strains that they grow for that dispensary. So they can have an educated conversation about what is there, but it is not a, a pharmacist or a physician or anything like that. Um, they are people that are trained in the medical marijuana space. Uh, I tell patients all the time that when they are going to a dispensary, they don't have to be married to that dispensary. So if they go and they ask their questions and they're not satisfied with what they hear, um, they can look and go elsewhere, which is why I said there's a little bit of a heavy lift on the patient's part to kind of do a little bit of their own research. Um, that is easier to do now because the dispensaries, while not technically unified in some sort of, of, of rating or classification, it's a business. So dispensaries now are moving away from, you know, being in a strip mall and kind of feeling a little bit seedy to being these beautiful gleaming buildings that look very um, uh, sterile with, you know, um, medical grade and, and bright light and spa-like and things like that. So they're fitting the optics of what will make patients comfortable and they are having better patient communications about it. So it's, it's an evolving process, but yes, there are some times when dispensaries are just not the right fit for patients and they need to look um, elsewhere. There's just actually just a comment came through that there are often pharmacists in Philadelphia area dispensaries. Okay. It's, so um, next question, where can you find state-by-state -state instructions when becoming certified? So it would, if you really just Google medical marijuana in the state, it'll pop up because all the Department of Health and Human Services um, have information on this on their website. Um, like I said, those two websites for Pennsylvania and New Jersey are right at the top of the Google list when you do it. Um, there are 37 states um, in the United States that are that where medical marijuana is legal. Uh, so um, again, you can just Google that as well, where which states have um, uh, is medical marijuana legal, it'll tell you and if any of our participants are in those states, they'll be able to find um, the registration process through their Department of Health. Now, there is a question, and I'm going to do an extension to that question. Can doctors look into becoming trained in the medical marijuana space? And then uh, is there any special to specific requirements or any nope. other? It can be it can be anybody. There isn't specialty specific requirements. Um, and yes, it's something that uh, sometimes there are institutional hurdles, depending on where you are, given it's scheduled um, class and stuff like that. But as far as specialty, there is nothing that is um, an issue with getting um, uh, licensed or certified. 
do you use CBD much for dyskinesias and have you found it to be effective and do you use it for dystonias? I do. I would say that I use it more for dystonias than dyskinesias. Um, uh, and really it is because it's that, you know, flip side of that same spasticity coin. Um, even though they're different mechanisms, they look a lot alike. The, uh, it can help relax the muscles. So it's a, um, I do find it more helpful. Dyskinesia, it's been a little hit or miss for me. Um, I can't say that it's a, it's a go-to by any stretch. Um, given that adenosine helps modulate the indirect pathway, does caffeine have a role in improving or worsening symptoms? It's a really good question. Um, and that's sort of how it, it came to pass. Uh, I think the amount of caffeine that you would have to take, much like the amount of fava beans you would have to eat to have an impact on dopamine, um, is just so incredibly high. But it's being looked into as some sort of uh, potential neuroprotective or uh, symptomatic improvement effect. Now, from your experience, from all the Parkinson's disease symptoms, uh, you know, motor, non-motor, mm -hmm. um, which would be the most, which would be the ones that are most responsive to cannabis? Sleep and anxiety, without a doubt. Okay. Yeah. And does that extend to other neurological diseases? I don't know, because I really see primarily Parkinson's. Um, okay. I've used it in my functional patients. Um, but again, that's just a that's a whole gray area of what it is we're actually treating there. But um, but again, sleep and anxiety has been, been been helpful for those patients as well. Yeah, you did explain that um, you know through the mechanism of action that it could have some antidepressant effect. Does mm -hmm. that um, uh, uh, do you have an experience with a uh, treating psychosis with it? I don't. I do. I honestly would probably shy away from using it in patients that were floridly psychotic unless we were trying to sedate them to a point where they were more manageable. Um, so, but if a patient has Parkinson's disease psychosis, I would say medical marijuana is not high on my list of things to try. That would be more of a Hail Mary if we needed it really for behavioral issues than anything else. I have a couple more questions, a couple more minutes, so I'm just gonna keep going. Yeah. Um, when it comes to sleep, um, do you think that cannabis is less sedating than, uh, sedating than clonazepam during those uh, wakening periods when the sleep is fragmented? I do, I do. Okay. Um, again, this is a little bit of repetition, but when you prescribe or refer, uh, do you refer for a specific strain or just no? No, unfortunately not. And I wish I had that because patients ask for it. I would like to have that, but we just don't have that information available yet. So you're, you're, you're on the, the, the advisory boards, et cetera. Tell mm -hmm. me how, because as I said, I think that's what the biggest discomfort is from the medical sure. providers that, you know, when you refer, it's, you know, you're not sure, you know, right. what's happening after that referral. Um, is there a movement actually to, to change that? There is. There is a movement to change it. Um, we are through Siri yesterday, I was just at a meeting um, speaking with insurance brokers to try and figure out a way to help streamline this more so that it becomes more palatable to both patients and docs in the prescribing practices of it. And not only that, um, that's from the practical prescribing point of view. From a research point of view, uh, Siri and other uh, institutions across the country, everybody's charge is to be able to get that evidence that doctors so desperately want so that they can feel more comfortable about using it and relay that information to the patient so patients can also feel more comfortable about using it. It's just that, like I said, we're going about it in a reverse way in um, a mechanism that is not what usual medical research does. So it's a harder process in one regard, but it's an easier process in another because a lot of these studies are um, uh, research and meta-analysis based and stuff like that. So you don't necessarily have a lot of the, the clunkiness of what randomized trials occur. Um, it's just, you need more of those secondary type studies to equal a foundational base of, of knowledge that a randomized trial can do. And uh, two quick questions. I promise those will be the last ones. Now, are seizures a concern for as a potential side effect? Seizures? In my patient population, no, I haven't seen that as an issue. Um, uh, also, as we said, Epidiolex is a cannabinoid medication that is being used to treat intractable seizures. So, And Charlotte's Web is probably the most famous medical marijuana strain that's used to treat seizures.
And then uh, there, there was this study that showed the possibility that marijuana increases the risk of stroke in young people, et cetera, at some point. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? I honestly don't know. Um, again, I don't use it primarily in young people um, to see, but I, so I couldn't answer, I'm sorry. All right, that's Dr. Farmer, it was great, great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, have a good day, everybody. Bye.